settling in after coming back from the Steam Fest, which is a festival annual meeting of many users of the Steam blockchain. And this is a nice way to introduce this post and ultimately this post is not really on a nice subject, but what really stood out to me when I went to Steam Fest in Poland was the freedom involved and how pretty much everyone there was loving and respecting the idea of being free. And, and I, someone pointed out that they hadn't really experienced that kind of energy in that sort of space other than in raves, the rave scene, you know, the kind of free party, illegal party scene in England. It's illegal anyway, but no one really pays that much attention to that. But um, basically parties, big parties where anyone can turn up and, you know, in a, usually maybe in an abandoned warehouse or something like that. But the point is, in that space, no one is going to tell you what to do. Basically, there's no gangs. Usually there's no violence. There's no security. Usually there's just people being themselves and that's pretty much what um what steam fest was like no one's going around saying you must do this you mustn't do that no security anywhere just people who either do or don't know each other who share a passion for steam and for hopefully making the world better through technology and freeing up commerce trade sharing communication in an uncensored way so in contrast to that I'm aware that a similar kind of system or some of the some of the features of the Steam blockchain, let's say, are also being used in another system in China that's actually run by the government. I believe it's called or it was called Sesame. I might be wrong on that, but um, ultimately their governmental name for it is Social Credit Score. Um, and I wrote about this, as you can see, last year. And at the time I was I went into quite a lot of detail about what I'd read about at the time. Um, sort of highlighting some of the really, frankly, overtly evil things that go on in China. I'm not saying all Chinese people are evil. You know, most countries do things that are objectively evil. The people in them do, typically. Um, I would include in there um, dairy farming or, you know, beef farming or whatever you want to call it, veal farming. Um, and China has dog farming and other things like that. You know, I'm not speciesist. To me, any form of exploitation of animals or beings like that is, is evil. But there's a difference here. Although um, my followers of my blog are going to be very well aware that I am well aware that Western governments and democracies have been deliberately engineered to be fake since the beginning. And so really they aren't any kind of a demonstration of actual freedom. There is a difference. Um, in China, you know, I've also written about a great length um, and, and given video testimony of, of whistleblowers from China, doctors and so on, who um, basically were involved in live organ harvesting from people. So people were basically sent to slave camps or prisons, wherever they were, uh, on the basis that they had a certain blood type or a certain biological configuration that made them desirable from organ for them from the perspective of organ transplants. And so they would be sentenced to death and in some cases basically the person would be deliberately not killed when when they were being shot and they would survive long enough for a doctor to come in take their living body into a into an ambulance and remove an organ while they're alive and then kill them by removing the organ this is not something that i've made up basically this is you can look at the international tribunal for uh, for international natural justice you can find that um on Steam and all over the web if you, if you look for it. And you'll find the testimony from the doctor who actually had to do this. He's actually basically admitting to murdering people in the testimony because he feared for his life if he didn't do it. Um, and he didn't, he wasn't even fully conscious that this was happening initially as he did it. But the point I'm making is something, there's something about the Chinese system, the governmental system, which is in many ways similar to the Soviet Russian system, whereby it it utterly degrades life, it utterly degrades humanity in the name of humanity. It's, it's so insane that it's difficult for me to even... Uh, there is no way to understand it, basically, unless you realise that it is an exploitative system. It's not a mad system. Well, it is a mad system, but it's not a system that was created to be mad by accident or stupidity. It was a mad system deliberately created to be mad, basically. Um... I don't fully know the exact reasons for that, but the, the ideology behind it essentially is 
socialism. And socialism is the step in between capitalism and communism. So communism was designed originally, as I understand it, to be a scientific replacement for capitalism, highlighting problems with capitalism and saying, uh, we're going to replace that with something much better and we're going to use science and logic to do that. That sounds great, except for what they completely failed to do was actually respect humanity and respect free will in that process. So they ended up creating something which basically took some of the worst things from capitalism, removed some of the bad things from capitalism, but kept some of the worst things, and then added in even more worse things, uh, and didn't add in very many good things. So you ended up pretty much with the, the version of communism that kind of got played out in various parts of the world basically was even worse than capitalism. Now, I'm not a big fan of capitalism, but I can't say that the communism that I've seen is any better. Basically, any system for humanity has to have a paramount respect for free will. If it doesn't, it's not a good system. And I, w I don't personally think capitalism does, although people like to claim it does. I think that it doesn't for a couple of very good reasons. And I think the communism that we've seen equally doesn't, or if anything, is much worse. So... It's no surprise to me that they've created, in a way, this system, but it it is still a surprise to me in the sense that they've done it and people are going along with it. I've actually seen some videos of people who, who don't question it enough and they basically just think, oh, it's a good thing, you know. Just to explain, what they've basically done is create a system which is going to go live soon, according to the latest report which I've read from the Times, which I'll move on to in a moment, uh, whereby somehow the governmental bodies give people scores for their behaviour not just in terms of necessarily breaking laws as such as i understand it but in in the sense that we might be familiar with it but it's based on trust they're literally trying to measure people's trustworthiness um and some of the examples they give to me are not they're not things that you would end up in court for but they're punishing you in a way that basically turns the entire nation into a prison potentially so in other words, you wouldn't necessarily need to end up in prison because as you lost social credit score, your ability to move and do things in the country would be decreased so much that you'd be virtually in prison, even though you would be not technically in an actual prison. Uh, and as an example, if we, if we move through to this new um, report from the, oh, it's the Independent, sorry. Um, so they're saying here that the system is going to be rolled out by 2020, obviously not too far away. And it says here, millions of Chinese nationals have been blocked from booking flights or trains as Beijing, the government, seeks to implement its controversial social credit system, which allows the government to closely monitor and judge, judge each of its 1.3 billion citizens based on their behaviour and activity. The system aims to make it difficult to move for those deemed untrustworthy, according to a detailed plan published by the government this week. It will be used to reward or punish people and organisations for trustworthiness across a range of measures. So, typically, our sort of court system doesn't really measure trustworthiness. It, it basically says, you broke the law or you didn't, and that's that. Uh, you know, there might be some sort of vague measurement of trustworthiness built into some situations, like sex offenders registries and things like that, where people need to constantly... Um, people are monitored because we don't trust them collectively or through the court system. It's been decided they don't, you know, they've, they've kind of abused the trust of the people. Um, but this is a, a totally general thing. And the examples they give um, further down, if I can find them, uh, are really, some of them are really just, I'm a little bit lost of words really, um, that they would even consider doing this. So it says here, the aim, according to Hao Yun Chun, former deputy director of the Development Research Centre of the State Council, is to make discredited people become bankrupt. So, discredited people. Well, discredited. That's a subjective thing. Discrediting people is subjective. You can go into a debate and, and discredit someone. Um, it doesn't mean to say you're right. But the conclusion from this is you become bankrupt. So it, in a way, it, I mean, considering that we need money in these systems to actually even eat, it's basically saying we're going to starve to death people who we don't like. That's pretty much what they're saying. It's just that they've done it through a computing system that is, uh, you know, gives it a sort of marketing spin. 
It actually reminds me of the computer systems that were used in concentration camps in Nazi Germany, um, where they monitored the size and weight and age of, of the people in there to figure out how much work they could force them to do before they died. Um, apparently. I wasn't there, but that's the story we're told. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, here we go. People are awarded credit points for activities such as undertaking volunteer work and giving blood donations, while those who violate traffic laws and charge under-the-table fees are punished. Other infractions reportedly include smoking in non-smoking zones, buying too many video games, and posting fake news online. Right. Okay, so the government is literally telling you if you play more video games than they say you can play, then potentially you won't be able to get on a train or a plane and will effectively be put in prison. And he's talking about literally making you bankrupt eventually through that system. So depending on how harsh it is, you, you know, it's not a stretch of the imagination to say it's possible you could starve to death in that system because you play too many video games. So, sounds a bit Orwellian, a bit harsh, a bit crazy, really. Um, but okay, let's look at it from a hardcore capitalist perspective. The hardcore capitalist perspective basically says, um, if you don't do any work and you sit around playing computer games all day, and you don't have a big stack of cash keeping you going, then basically you... Sh just market forces will result in you not having enough money to buy food, so therefore you will either die or you'll be forced to stop playing computer games and go and get some food and money. So you're going to get up and motivate and do stuff. What they're saying is, basically, we are going to decide, not the market, the government's going to decide what is the actual amount of, of computer games that you can play that's acceptable. And if you play more than that, then you're going to have problems. And we're going to make that happen. Now, I don't know exactly how, um, let's say, social welfare works in China. I don't know whether the government will give you food if you're poor. I actually don't know anything about that. I'd be interested to learn about that. But what I do understand is that, as I understand it, they have a form of capitalism there, um, and which is in itself slightly strange, since they call themselves socialists, and socialism is intended to be something moving as quickly as possible away from that but anyway um so it it's this strange mixture of you can do what you want except for when we say you can't do it and you don't even have to be basically doing anything that causes anyone any problems um in other words if you were particularly good at capitalism and you made a lot of money and you had it sat there and you sat around playing lots of computer, computer games as a result you can still be punished, even though you've done well enough, theoretically, let's say you made the nation a billion dollars a year, you were a big player in their economy, you can still lose all of your rights because you play too many computer games. So it's got nothing really to do, theoretically, with, well, they, if you did have that much money, I'm sure you'd be able to bribe them all anyway, but theoretically, the message that it's putting across is, if you, um, regardless of how successful you are, if you aren't investing all of your time or a significant amount of your time into things we say you must invest them into, then we're going to punish you. So that really is actually technically a form of slavery um, because I'm pretty sure, I mean, the things that it says there, for example, rewarding points for, giving you points for volunteer work and giving blood donations. Well, volunteer work means you choose to do it for no apparent benefit. You just do it. But if you're being given points that, move you away from being punished, then it's not really volunteer work, is it? You're being coerced to do that work under threat of basically punishment. So, that I mean, that's the definition as far as I'm concerned of slavery. It's basically slavery. So, what can you say? This is literally a slavery system. Um, and it's it's got all the hallmarks of that. And it's got, um, I mean, like I say, the, the system is, it, I think it's going to become quite rapidly a futuristic or more advanced version of what happened in the, in the um, concentration camps of uh, Germany. And as I, you know, I don't really know what to say. It's just, it's shocking. And I, considering that they've got literally, what was it, was it 1.3 billion people in China? What is that? That's a, a good percentage of the entire planet is under this system. It's not just like a few people living in the hills somewhere. It's it's like a really significant percentage of the planet. What happens when that significant number of people 
gets completely enslaved. What happens? Um, what happens when the people running the government decide to step things up a bit and actually impro- program those people with deeper and deeper forms of mind control so that they basically become trauma trauma um, trauma based mind control victims to the point where literally they've got no self determination they've got no will what happens basically then you've got a significant percentage of the of the world's population able to be remote controlled by a very small number of people to do basically anything uh, and I'm suggesting to you that they really aren't very far away from that, given the advances that have been made in this technology to control people in terms of um, mind control. And I, this is a difficult subject to talk about because most people haven't got the faintest idea of what I'm talking about. They don't really appreciate that mind control is a real thing and that people can actually be controlled through the mind. You don't have to walk around whipping someone or pointing a gun at them to get them to do things that you want them to do. You don't even have to use money. You can do it. I mean, hypnosis is an example of, of a very light version of what I'm talking about. But on the other end, you can actually use trauma that's been created deliberately in a very large number of ways to imprint programs into people. I'm not going to go into all of that now. It's good. One thing to research is MK Ultra. If you type that into the web, you'll find probably a million web pages um, where the US government admitted to be doing this to its own people illegally. Um, so. Yeah, it's just really sad to me that that I can come from a space where there's 300 people. Um, not sure if there's anyone from China there. There might have been, um, but it's sad to come from a space with so many people who are living as close to free as they can. That you know they're getting paid for blogging. They're literally actively engaging in doing things to raise consciousness, raise awareness of the power of freedom, real freedom. And on the flip side you've got a similar technology being used to do the complete opposite in the most horrible way I can imagine. So I'm not really sure where this where this is going. I mean, that, that's a huge number of people. How does how do we, the rest of the world, bearing in mind that it's really only a small percentage of the rest of the world that is in a position to um, respond to this and actually even understand it in the sense that Many people aren't paying attention. Many people are, uh, don't even pay attention to the, to the news. They're not, you know, online even still in some parts of the world. And even in parts of the world where we are, you know, a bit more online and aware of this stuff, most people aren't paying attention anyway. They're definitely not going to actually do anything about it. Uh, so what the hell do we do? Um, I mean, some people are just relying on the ability to sort of nuke anyone, that, any nation that goes completely insane and tries to attack the rest of the world and take them over. But from my perspective... Obviously, that isn't the solution. So what can we do? <laughs> I mean, we could agree to not trade with China, for example, until they until they actually treat their people with more respect. Um, but then you run the risk of things turning a bit more like, uh, you know, North Korea, maybe, where they start to go a bit inward and, and a bit um, defensive and kind of turning against the outer world. And then what's going to happen? But I think one of the biggest problems is basically China is making most of the world's plastic stuff. Um, and, I, you know, I know that Taiwan is said to be uh, another alternative that companies could use, which is not so oppressive. But I think ultimately we need to actually stop using these countries to produce our things is really what it comes down to, because that's how they're getting a lot of this power. And it is exploitative. They are basically enslaving their own people to make a few people rich and so that you can have plastic stuff that doesn't cost very much. So you've been, or not not specifically necessarily you, maybe you're really smart, but we collectively are being deceived into thinking that by giving the fruits of our labour to these people for giving us plastic stuff that's cheap, we think that we're somehow living like kings and this is going to last forever and everything's going to be great. That's not really very likely in the sense that a large percentage of the people literally being stomped on in order to achieve this. And I would say the, the, the losses to humanity as a result of this happening are far in excess of the benefits. Uh, I mean, on this ty- on the independent page here, you've got like Nike and Adidas trainers. I'm sure most of those probably, either they're not made in China, they're going to be made somewhere like that in terms of the way people are treated. And I, I've, seen, I've seen printouts from a Nike factory where they show you the time that's allowed for each worker to do certain tasks. And it's measured to like 0.0001 of a second or something like that. It's just, it's so inhumane, I don't even know how to do I mean, it's the equivalent of factory farming, 
where you see like millions of or hundreds of thousands of chicks on the, on on the ground in a dark um, warehouse being swept up by a machine that crushes them to death. I mean, it's so it's literally like a horror movie. I, I, we are literally living in a world where a significant percentage of the population is either involved in creating or involved in suffering the effects of, of something akin to being in a horror movie. Um, and it's just amazing to me that so many people don't pay attention to it, don't understand this is happening. Um, if we look at this picture and zoom in a bit here, yeah, it's Sesame Credit, right. This is effectively where we're going. I, I used to laugh to my, well, not laugh to myself, but I used to imagine when I was a small child, or a teenager actually, I used to wonder, oh, how cool would it be if I could see something exactly like what we're seeing on this screen um, for women? So I could see what percentage chance there is of that woman liking me. So I don't have to waste my time going around talking to endless people, trying to find a girlfriend. I would just be able to see immediately. Um, and maybe in the future we're going to have something like that. Maybe the uh, the dating sites we see today that give you a percentage score of match, uh, chance of match and so on, you'll actually be able to see that. Let's say you're wearing a pair of glasses, like Google Glasses, and you have a little marker whenever someone walks past you who's on that dating site and it will show you, oh, hey, that's an 80% chance. You could go and talk to that person. Now, in principle, that, there's some positive outcomes you can imagine from that. It could be fun, you know, it, as long as you don't rely on it and stop paying attention to your intuition and so on. If you, you know, it, it could be a fun thing to play with. But when this scoring system basically shows you, oh, that's a person the state says is untrustworthy, you should probably pay attention to that person and probably shouldn't actually deal with them or help them. You know, maybe they've got a flat tire. Don't bother for them. No, they're not trustworthy. You don't necessarily have the means to check whether that's right or not. But it comes down to whether or not the people actually use the system in a way that is empowered. In other words, do they just use it like a, not a fun tool, but do they use it as something that they have a choice about? Or do they use it in the sense of, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm worried about losing score if I don't go along with the system? And as I understand it, that is how the system is going to be rolled out. So if you basically um, are friends with somebody who does bad things, according to the state, then your score can go down. So you're basically then in a situation where you're literally splitting the population up between the alleged good people and the alleged bad people. And, and I mean, I don't, I, what can I say? I mean, if it actually was a, a measurement of lovingness and actual intelligence and wisdom, and you were basically separating between people between wisdom and unconsciousness, then that could be, you know, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but it could at least be interesting. You could see some interesting things come out of that. Maybe by filtering all of the wisest people together in the whole nation out of a billion people, suddenly you see some amazing things happen just from that happening. But that isn't what this system is. This is actually just the state determining what's good and bad and then um, kind of basically controlling and punishing people as a result. Um, and maybe and I know there's examples where it's talking about, for example, you might be able to hire a car without um, putting a deposit down. That kind of thing would be a benefit of having a good score. So it literally, this is this is really what this comes down to. I'll just end on this point. I've written a lot about emotional healing and um, in the past, and emotions are motion, energy motion, emotion, energy motion. Emotion is moving energy. So when you have an emotion, if you really feel it a lot eventually you're probably going to want to move and you'll realize if you keep doing that that is actually emotion that keeps us alive it's what keeps the planet going round, if you want to call it that it's what makes things happen so it's what guides our decisions and if you've got this system which is purely based on enabling or limiting movement then you literally have a system which is unlovingly controlling and dominating the will of the people it couldn't be more obvious so when this tries to speak as if it's for the people, which if we look on this Google translation page, this is actually the government document which was published that announced this apparently. Uh, and you know, Google Translate is not the best in the world, but this does actually make sense when I read it. it I, I get the feeling it's not a bad translation. Um, and if we go down to uh, social credit section, um, Basically, it's explaining here, it's a little bit like a white paper for, for an ICO or something. Im improve the credit joint reward and punishment mechanism. Establish a sound data list, a list of actions, a list of measures, etc. The city's unified credit joint reward and punishment three list system by the end of 2020. Individual credits project covering all permanent residents will be built on credit information will be prompted, promoted in the market. Services, travel, entrepreneurship and job search 
are widely used. So it sounds like what they're saying is, you know, you, you'll be hindered at getting jobs if you do things that are considered untrustworthy. And untrustworthy basically means you do things that you were told not to do. So if someone tells you not to do something and you do it anyway, then you might not get a job even though that you might not personally agree with what they're telling you not to do. And in fact, most people might not agree with that. And most people might consider it basically crazy and evil for them to try and tell you to not do that thing. You still might not be able to get a job as a result of it. So this, I mean, this literally is, I, I've only read part of 1984 by George Orwell. So I'm, you know, I'm, and I think I might've seen it on, as a film a long time ago, but I mean, it sounds to me that this literally is 1984. It's not, you know, in fact, this is 1995, if you want to call it that. This is a long time after 1984, because what they're talking about doing here is is just... I just really, to be honest, I really hope that the, the Chinese people wake up and the dragon in them wakes up and the energy wakes up and they just realise that we can't do this. We can't, we can't have these people dictating our destiny in this way, in a way that limits us so hugely and removes our power from us and makes us feel like empty vessels with no purpose or value on planet earth this is so degrading it's disgusting i don't even know what to say about it um so yeah let's as as technologists and and uh, creators co-creators on this planet how about we uh, do our best to set the most high quality example we can for the people of china to show them that alternatives exist um, where we can be empowered to do amazing things using technology and so on in these sorts of ways but without any form of punishment without needing to punish people we don't need to be punished to learn things if there's any message from this video punishment is not something that needs to be involved in the process of learning you can learn without punishment actually better than with punishment and really that's what this comes down to so i you know i think by now humanity basically understands that on a certain level so if you are punishing people and the pretense is that you're going to teach them to be better people then you are lying you aren't doing it because of that. You're doing it basically because you want to control people, which is probably because you want personal power gain. So we're dealing with enslavement. And um, yeah, I've talked now for nearly 30 minutes. So I don't want to, uh, you know, enslave your mind, let's say. But um, do let us know in the comments what you think about this and if you've got any extra information to add to it. And if you've got any creative ideas that you can come up with that uh, might be able to be implemented online, let's say, in between now and 2020 so that we can mitigate and, and uh, minimize the harm done by this and this offense against humanity so until next time uh, much love and uh, catch you soon